Boom. There we go. Okay, we're there recording. We Johan, the floor is yours. Apologies for the delay. Okay, that's great. Okay, thanks. So, um, so this uh, this talk is going to be about uh, statistical power, um, the significance thresholds we adopt in our null hypothesis significance testing, and how that impacts the expected reproducibility of our results. That is, when we reject the null hypothesis, how often can we expect to have made a genuine discovery, a true positive, as opposed to a false positive claim? Um, I'm feeling a little bit bad about my title because I, I put practical in there and I may have set the wrong expectations. So I won't be showing you anything about G power or anything about that today. It's going to be a little bit more theoretical than that. Um, hopefully still useful. It will become more practical as the as the talk wears on. So if it seems like I'm in a conceptual space to begin with, don't worry, we will we will approach reality towards the end. So um, why are we talking about reproducibility? Well, I think there's pretty good evidence by now that there is a reproducibility crisis in science. Um, I don't think this is necessarily a new thing, but over the past 10 years or so, we've become increasingly aware of the problem, is how I would describe it. Um, so I have a couple of brief examples of papers making this point here. First one comes from uh, pharma research. So the way pharma research works generally is that when there is an exciting finding published in the primary literature, um, that seems promising for a drug discovery, the first thing the company will do is to do an internal replication of the published result. Um, and according to this questionnaire metric where pharma researchers are um, reporting on their experiences with these projects, something like 65% of the projects get cut at this point because you can't reproduce that published effect. Um, so that seems a little high. Um, closer to home, of course, we have uh, the Many Labs project from uh, Brian Nosek with many collaborators. First one of these is this paper, which came out in 2015. So here we have a selection of studies from Psych Science, JPSP, and Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning, Memory, and Cognition, uh, with large-scale pre-registered replications. And depending on your definition of a replication, which gets us into somewhat thorny territory, um, the replication rate here is somewhere around 50% to 33%. So something like half or a third of the studies are actually reproducible in a new sample. Um, here's the same kind of reproducibility effort applied to a different field. So this is behavioral economics. Um, the result is not all that dissimilar. So again, we're looking at um, just over half of the studies replicate when that's investigated. Um, final example I'll show you is the follow-up of the original many lab study, many labs two. I believe there's now a three and four and possibly even more out there. So this is another, this time more of a handcrafted selection of psychology studies. Replication rate turns out to be quite similar. So overall, just under half of the studies were reproducible. Um, so this seems problematic, right? We want to be able to have a little bit more faith than that in individual studies. Um, so why is this happening? What's the problem with reproducibility? Um, there's a bunch of causes of poor reproducibility that I'm not going to talk about today in detail. Um, the first one that probably springs to mind is questionable research practices, p-hacking, researcher degrees of freedom, lumping and splitting in between subjects to science, stuff like that. And that can certainly inflate your false positives. There's also more boring code quality kind of reasons for irreproducibility. That's something that I'm, I feel more strongly about. Um, we tend to write quite bad code as scientists and that will surprisingly often lead to results that are not reproducible. That is, the result is an artifact of your um, analysis code. Um, there's a more sort of conceptual issue about generalization, that is what what kind of generalization can we expect to a new experiment, a new data set? For instance, if we're not modeling our stimuli as random effects, can we strictly expect that if we took a new set of stimulus images and contracted the same conditions, do we expect to reproduce our results under those conditions? Stuff like that. And I guess the ultimate sort of causes of poor reproducibility and the ultimate solutions are more to do with incentive structures in science. So especially if you're an early career researcher, you may be quite conscious of the fact that your chances of survival in this highly competitive field uh, will be determined by your ability to publish a large number of novel and statistically significant results in a short space of time. 
Uh, and that's a recipe for something, but it's not a recipe for reproducibility, right? Um, so those are all things I think we're vaguely conscious of, I hope, but um, I want to focus today on a slightly less well appreciated side of the reproducibility coin, and that's to do with um, our experimental design and null hypothesis significance testing and how that affects how much reproducibility we can expect. So I'm hoping to show that when statistical power is low or when you're testing unlikely hypotheses with um, conventional significance thresholds, um, those conditions can be sufficient to have low reproducibility in the sense that a statistically significant test is more likely to be a false positive than a real discovery. So we don't need to go straight for the sort of character assassinations when there's a non-replication necessarily. Um, it turns out that you can have low reproducibility simply from something like low statistical power. Um, and I don't think that's always widely appreciated. So I'm gonna try and drive that point home today and that's gonna be the bulk of the talk. Um, towards the end, I'll turn to the more practical issue of sample size calculations. So suppose you want to increase your statistical power. You're going to get an effect size estimate from the literature, and now you're going to calculate what, what you need for 80% power in your design. What's wrong with that? Well, there's quite a lot wrong with that, it turns out. I'm going to do some simple simulations at the end to illustrate that that kind of naive power analysis approach can actually lead you to perpetuate low statistical power when power was low in the first place. Um, and I'll close with some recommendations. So let's talk first about this reproducibility angle. So this is going to depend critically on calculating this thing uh, called a positive predictive value, which is this useful quantity that tells us basically for a significant test, how likely is it that that significant test is a true positive rather than a false positive. Um, but before we do that, we need to remind ourselves of the introductory statistics angle. So if you took a psychology um, undergraduate, like I did, and you took introduction to statistics, you probably were confronted with this table. So we've got in the columns the states of the world, the null hypothesis is true or the null hypothesis is false, and in the rows we have the outcomes of our statistical tests, so the test is significant or it's not significant. And hopefully most of you are familiar with how this plays out. So when the null hypothesis is true, the first column, we're going to have significance threshold alpha, and uh, depending on whether our p-value that we calculate for our test, if our p-value is smaller than the alpha threshold, we will reject the null hypothesis. And we know that if we do that, then on average, we will have alpha proportion of false positives under the null hypothesis, so 5%. Um, when the null hypothesis is false, the quantity we think about is beta, the false negative rate, um, which is the proportion of statistical tests that are going to be non-significant when the effect is not null and of the size that our power analysis suggests. Um, we tend to think about that more in terms of the complement power, so one minus beta. Um, so the probability, um, given a particular effect size in bold, because that's important, that we will reject the null hypothesis when it is indeed false. Um, so the big unknown here that uh, most of you are conscious of is going to be the effect size, right? So for the null false scenario, we are not going to have these parameters, beta depends not just on the significance threshold alpha, but also depends on the effect size. Uh, and we don't tend to know the effect size, especially when we're doing um, discovery science. If we knew the effect size, we probably wouldn't do the experiment. Um, but there's a sort of bigger unknown here that prevents us from um, knowing useful things about how well this procedure performs. And that is, how often is the null hypothesis false on average? So if we think of this as another frequentist quantity, when we are doing this hypothesis testing regime for a particular literature, on average, we are going to be testing a true hypothesis, say 50% of the time or 25% of the time, or well, what is that probability that we're in this column versus that column? And that's kind of key for getting useful answers, because what we really want to know is not so much about what's happening given the null and what's happening given the null when the null is false, because we don't know about that, right? That's not known about the world. What we do have is a statistical test, which is significant or not significant. And what we really would like to find out is that when I have a significant result, how likely is it that that result comes from the null true case? That is, it's a false positive. How likely is it that it comes from the null false case? And without knowing something about the marginal probabilities up here, we can't estimate those sort of quantities. So 
for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to talk about this parameter, about how often the null is true or null is false, as the true effect prevalence rate. Um, in some previous research, for those of you who have done some reading into this, you'll come across this specified as, uh, as odds. I find proportions more intuitive, so I'm going to use it as a proportion. Um, so this is a value that's going to go so it's going to be zero if every single hypothesis you test in a given literature is false. So it's just noise mining all the way through. It's going to be one if every single hypothesis is true, right? Um, and I think this is a useful thing to think about for a moment. If we were a CBU, I might attempt some audience participation to invite you to speculate about what, what your true effect prevalence rate might be. Uh, but I'm not going to do that over Zoom. Um, I think it might be... Um, it's one of those things where you can almost argue it either way. Worth appreciating from the start that it's not going to be the proportion of significant tests you've obtained because that depends on statistical power, right? Which you generally don't know. So um, if you think about it, you could sort of argue any position along the scale. So for instance, um, I have a past in social neuroscience, so I get sent a bunch of really dubious MVPA decoding studies to review, uh, and on days when that is especially frustrating, I might think that, oh, actually, the true effect prevalence rate in this stuff is going to be close to zero. There's just a tremendous amount of noise that people are chasing things out of. Um, but in other contexts, you might think the prevalence rate might be close to one. So there might be lots of research where the fact, the way things are going to work out is not really in any doubt. And the thing you're interested in really is estimating the, the magnitude of the effect, right? And um, the null hypothesis significance test is almost like a sanity check to convince the reviewers that you have collected a sensible amount of data so you can at least reject the null hypothesis for this thing that everyone basically believes is true anyway, right? Uh, but I think in practice as scientists, the way this works out is that we are sort of, when you plan your own research, you're sort of implicitly tuning this parameter, right? You're thinking about, when you think about a new experiment you want to do, you probably don't want to go for an experiment that comes from the close to zero part of the range where it's exceedingly unlikely that it's true because even though that would be you know, tremendously exciting to demonstrate something that people really didn't believe in, um, you're gonna have a lot of negative results necessarily, right? And those will be difficult to publish under the current incentive structures. Um, there are also statistical reasons why going after really rare effects with the standard significance threshold of 0.05 is a bad idea and I'm gonna get onto that in a bit. Uh, but conversely, you probably don't want to be pursuing a search where the probability that you're right in the first place is almost one, because what's the point, right? You're, you're collecting data to try and learn something new about the world. And if you knew before you even started data collection what was going to happen, then what, what's the point? You know, it's hypothesis testing is not supposed to be a victory lap. Um, but I think, this is a quantity we have, to, uh, we have to think about a little bit, right? So let's suppose that we have a guess at this value. Um, the cool thing about this is that once we have a rate to the prevalence, then we can start calculating useful quantities like a positive predictive value. And this is a value that's going to tell us, tell us um, out of all of the significant tests I report, what proportion of them are true positives rather than false positives. So this is incredibly useful, right? It, it requires us to make assumptions about some unknowns. Here we knew already that power is kind of unknown. Prevalence is certainly unknown. Uh, but assuming that we're willing to come up with some parameters for those values, we can now quanti calculate this thing that seems really useful. Um, so this idea of applying positive predictive values to uh, characterize research literatures was popularized originally by this uh, John Ioannidis in 2005 in this paper with a slightly bombastic title. Um, and the quantity here is, is really simple. So I read this when I was a first year undergraduate. I didn't understand how he was able to claim that most published research findings are false, but it's embarrassing now to me because this is so easy to calculate, actually. Um, the formulation I'm using here is slightly different from what uh, John is using in the paper, but it's really, it does not take much maths to understand. And that's why I put it on the slide, uh, even though I generally don't approve of equations on slides. So just to appreciate what's going on here, we've got one minus beta, which is power, prevalence, which is the proportion of cases when the null is false. So this is gonna be the hits, if you will, right? So the null is false and we have power. 
going to scale that by the same term plus the false positives. So alpha is the false positive rates, one minus prevalence to capture the part of the hypothesis testing cake where the null hypothesis is true. Um, so basically, this is going to be the hits divided by the hits plus the false alarms. Easy, right? Um, so this idea of thinking about reproducibility in this way is, is quite popular and you can see it pop up all over the place in different names. So for those of you who may have come across these before, just to point out that all of these different terms are referring to the same thing, but some of them are really poorly chosen. So uh, Cole Cahoon originally termed this kind of calculation of false discovery rate. That is not the multiple comparisons correction method, right? That's inviting confusion. Uh, Benjamin et al. called it the false positive rate. I think they did that on purpose because they're try they're hardcore Bayesians and they want to point out that what you think of as the false positive rate alpha is not the false positive rate. Actually, one minus PPV is the false positive rate. But anyway, um, false report probability is probably the thing that's closest to what this is measuring. Um, if you come from a machine learning background, you might know that the same kind of proportion is described as precision uh, when you're evaluating the performance of a classifier. So these are all different names for the same thing. Um, now we can do the same kind of thing on the remaining part of the hypothesis testing contingency table. And this is something that I've not seen done in the published literature, but it's, it's perfectly straightforward to calculate. So we can take out of all of the non-significant tests, which is going to be down here, we're going to have non-significant tests that are correct rejections, if you will. So the null is true and we have one minus alpha for the correct rejection rate of those and the false negatives. So the null hypothesis was actually false, but we failed to reject it. What proportion of those non of those non-significant tests are true negatives? That is, how often are we, how often is it the case that we're not missing something when we fail to reject the null hypothesis? Um, and I guess this is all starting to get a little funny right intellectually. So if we take a step back and think about what sort of reality we're simulating with these calculations, this is all sort of Neiman Pearson null hypothesis testing stuff that you know makes your head go a little bit funny when you think about it. So we're sort of imagining a world where effects are drawn from this bimodal distribution, right? So there's going to be uh, the null case where effects come from the null distribution, so effects centered on zero, and that's going to be the case in one minus prevalence proportion of the cases. And then there's another peak in the distribution, which is going to be away from the null, and it's going to be far enough away to have the statistical power that we are assuming in these calculations. And there, and we're going to be over on that peak in prevalence proportion of the cases, and importantly, there is nothing in between, right? So this is the funny dichotomous world of uh, Neiman Pearson hypothesis testing, which we've all signed up for, by the way, when we calculate null hypothesis in the test in the first place. Um, but I think you know, one reason why people don't like to think about power analysis is perhaps not because it's hard, but because it sort of leads to uncomfortable decisions. It makes it much more obvious what's funny about null hypothesis significance testing than the alpha and false positive side of things. Um, so let's keep that in mind. Um, so some of you in the back might be thinking that, well, okay, this sounds reasonable enough. I'm, I'm happy to think about effect prevalence rates, but isn't this going in a slightly Bayesian direction here? Are you about to end this treatment in some recommendation that we throw this overboard and go to Bayesian inference across the board? Um, I've illustrated that suggestion here with this graphic, which I, this is intended to show the city of Troy, which is the a happy city of uh, frequentist null hypothesis significance testers who have just invited in the Trojan horse, which would be this PPV and PV stuff, which seems intuitive and easy to think about. But inside the horse, you have the reverend base, right? Um, and indeed you do, because if you think about this, uh, the PPV can be considered the posterior probability of a true effect given a significant test. Um, the NPV uh, is one minus the posterior probability of true effect given a non-significant statistical test. So yeah, uh, positive and negative predictive values uh, does sort of open the door to a very mild form of Bayesianism. It does in, is basically incorporates a minimum sort of base light or diet base kind of 
thinking about prior probabilities into our conventional null hypothesis significance testing enterprise. Um, but of course, if you're a real Bayesian, you're going to hate this stuff anyway, because we are still dichotomizing the world into these ridiculous categories of significant and not significant. Uh, many Bayesians would also think that it's kind of silly to be testing null and alternate hypotheses. Um, so this is still a far cry from full Bayesian inference, but what I like about it is that it also does not import the full complexity of Bayesian inference, right? So it basically says that, okay, suppose that we are going to be doing null hypothesis significance testing, we're going to have p-values that we have to think about, or even if we're not going to do it, the rest of the field will still be doing this. How do we think about those p-values? Well, by thinking about the positive and negative predictive values, we can start, sort of start thinking about when is this uh, null hypothesis testing decision-making process going to lead to good decisions, and when is it going to lead to bad decisions? Um, and I'll show you both cases. So there will be cases where it's not as bad as you might think, and there'll be cases where we are making ridiculous decisions when we declare that there's an effect when p is less than 0.05. Um, so let's turn to that. Um, I'm going to start this by showing a few example scenarios, and these are sort of cases of particular literatures that I, you know, I find somewhat plausible. Um, so the first scenario where I've turned well power discovery science. So here we're um, assuming that we're in a literature where power is 80%, just a um, gold standard. Um, the prevalence of true effects is 25%. So we're doing reasonably risky research here. Um, if we calculate the positive predictive value in that scenario, it's 84%. So four out of five times when we reject the null hypothesis, we are on to a true positive. Um, the negative predictive value is 93%. So nine out of ten times when we do not reject the null hypothesis there is really nothing going on so that seems pretty good right if if that's the state of things then i think we're you know we're okay with null hypothesis significance testing why 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 deal with all that bayesian complexity right um just to drive home before i go to the next example the simplicity of these calculations right so ppv in this case um is really just different proportions of this sort of hypothesis testing pie. So the pie chart illustrates all of the hypotheses being tested in this literature. Uh, the yellow cases are the cases where the null hypothesis is true. The purple cases is when it's false, and the shading indicates whether the significance test is significant or not significant. So power is just going to be the proportion of the purple guys where you actually reject the null. And the false positive rate alpha is just going to be the proportion of the negative cases where you reject the null hypothesis, right? So the PPV is literally just comparing all of the dark shaded areas where P is less than 0.05. What proportion of that area is in the null is false case? You can see that most of it is false here, right? Or most of it's in the null is false case. Conversely, the negative predictive value is the light shaded areas. So out of all of the negative tests, what proportion of them are in the null is false part of the space, right? So that sounds pretty good, right? Um, what happens though if statistical power is lower? Um, there's a review article from uh, Kate Button published a few years ago now arguing that power in neuroscience might be more like 20%. Um, suppose that we're in the same effect prevalence rate, but now power is 20%. Um, that is bad for both PPV and MPV. Just to appreciate what's changing here, if I go back and forth a couple of times, you can see the only thing that's changing is the part of the purple guy that's shaded dark for significant result. That's the only change. Um, but the PPV is now closer to 50%. So when we have a significant result, it's going to be hard for us to know whether we have a true positive over here or a false positive over here. Um, the negative predictive value has also gone down. So of course, with less power, we're less confident in negative results. Um, so what that means, one important takeaway from this is that when power goes down, we lose confidence in both positive and negative effects. Um, let's imagine another scenario. Um, this one is a bit more interesting to think about. So suppose that you do have high power. You've collected a lot of data, but you're going after an exceptionally unlikely hypothesis. So the true effect prevalence rate is about 5% here. Um, even though you have high power, your positive predictive value in this condition is under 50%. So it's more likely that your effect is a false positive than a true power, a positive. 
And you can see why that happens quite intuitively from the pie chart again, um, because the null false part of the pie is so small, it doesn't really, it's not enough to be able to reject really well in here, you're still dwarfed by the false positive rate in the much bigger null is true case, right? And that's why your PPD ends up low. So what am I thinking about here? Should we just name some names at this point? I think we should name some names. So the kind of scenario I'm imagining here is something like uh, Daryl Bem's paper on evidence for extrasensory perception, which was published nine years ago now, apparently. Um, so this is quite a large data set. He presents data from the thousands of subjects uh, claiming to have demonstrated ESP. Um, and there are many problems with this paper. Um, you can research it if you're interested. Um, but I think in a way you don't have to engage with the complexities of the paper and the possible questionable research practices that may have inflated his false positives further because if you think that the prior probability of ESP being you know, a true pro hypothesis is low enough, that's the effective prevalence right here, then you should not be convinced by P less than 0.05 anyway, even if he had pre-registered the whole thing, right? Um, by the way, this was actually not replicated in a subsequent study from Richie and colleagues. Um, for some reason, the non-replication got much fewer citations. So final scenario. Um, let's suppose that we are underpowered again, but we are testing, uh, we are in the research regime where the null hypothesis is mostly true anyway, or not mostly false anyway. So the effect prevalence is about 70%. And this is the one that's sort of closest to my heart because this I think gets at something that I see quite a lot in psychology research. So what happens in that regime is basically that when you reject the null hypothesis, uh, it's overwhelmingly likely to be a true positive. Your PPV is 90%. Um, and you can see that over here, this, even though you're mostly not rejecting the null hypothesis when it is false, it's the null hypothesis is false so often that even by scoring a few hits here, that's still enough to overwhelm the false positive rate because that's just far more or less likely that the null is true. Um, so that's working out really well, even though we have low power, but the price you pay is a horrible negative predictive value. So when you don't have a significant result, it's actually more likely, quite a bit more likely, that it's a false negative than a true negative. Um, and to think about when this sort of thing might be happening, let's suppose that you're doing a PhD in psychology, you do a series of experiments. In the first study, you get an effect, P less than 0.05. Um, experiment two, you change a couple of aspects of your paradigm, the effect is gone, P greater than 0.05. Um, experiment three, you change a few other things, the effect is still gone. Experiment four, you change some other stuff, the effect comes back. Experiment five, the effect is still there. Experiment six, it's gone again. And now you're out of time, you have to write up your PhD. And when you get to the discussion section, um, if you are a typical psychology student, and perhaps more importantly, your advisor is a typical psychology uh, PI, uh, you're going to come up with this kind of intricate account that explains why the effect was there in some of these experiments and then disappeared in the other experiments, came back again. Uh, and you'll probably use the term context dependent quite a lot. And your, uh, your goal with this will be to spin a sort of integrated theoretical account for your phenomenon using this pattern of significance and non-significance. And the problem with doing that is that um, Another way to explain that sort of pattern of significance and non-significance is to say that your contextual manipulations, the tweaks to your paradigm, may have had zero effects. Um, and all that's going on here is that you have low statistical power. If your power is about 50%, that means you'll reject half the time. So ultimately, you're right. Your effect is real. It's there. It's just that power is low. And so sometimes it's there, and sometimes it's not. And Unfortunately, I think it's easy in that scenario to start trying to read in meaning into these patterns of significance and non-significance when potentially all that's going on is low statistical power. Um, so let's plot these concepts out a little bit more continuously. So I've put in these following graphs, I've put the effect prevalence rate on the x-axis because this is the thing we don't know about, right? So we wanna plot it out and make sure we understand what how it would matter depending on where we are, given that we don't know where we are. 
So the first example here, we have low statistical power again, so power of 20. And just like what you saw in the previous case, when we have a true effect prevalence rate that's high, then the PPV can be quite high, but the NPV is low. That's the last scenario I just showed you. But importantly, there is really no point along this line where you have confidence in both your positive and your negative results, right? Um, if we have conventional rates of power, 80% power, um, there is this range sort of in the middle of the graph. So if your true effect prevalence rate is somewhere from 25 to 50%, you're actually making decent decisions with null hypothesis and appearance testing, right? Um, so I've shaded the part of the graph here where both of these curves are over 80%, that's arbitrary. Um, but you can see in this case, we're kind of making reasonable decisions here, but if we are going after something a little bit higher risk, um, if we're doing discovery research, it might be plausible to think that we're more over in this lower range, below 25%, and you can see that when you get to that level, the positive predictive value curve just goes off a cliff, right? You can't get on top of that. So, so what can you do in that situation? Um, collect more data, maybe? So if you collect more data, we increase statistical power. What happens then? Um, well, we, are, we mainly change the negative predictive value curve. So you can see this, the blue curve has gone up quite a bit when we increase statistical power to 95%, but the positive predictive value curve, it has actually changed a little bit, but it's almost too small to see in this particular graphic. Um, still not getting at those rare effects, right? And that's because alpha is 0.5, right? So we're struggling to distinguish rare, but rare effects from the false positive rate. Um, so what can we do? Well, the remaining lever is, of course, the significance threshold. So um, here's a paper from a couple of years ago that uh, made this claim that we should change this, the default threshold for new discoveries to 0 0.005. Um, one of the main arguments for that in the paper is this kind of positive predictive value style analysis. So if you are on top of these calculations now, then you know what at least part of the argument about. The other part uses base factors, and I don't pretend to understand what they're all about there. So um, what happens if we set alpha to 0 0.005? Well, the bottom panels here now show the same calculations, but setting alpha to 0 0.05. And you can see that across the board, what happens is that the positive predictive value curve is now much better behaved in this low effect prevalence range. So for going after rare effects, we can have much more confidence when we reject the null hypothesis. Um, with an alpha of 0.05. And that's true even when power is quite low. So here we're looking at 20% power and you still have reasonable PPV for an effect that has a effect prevalence rate of 15%, something like that. You're still doing okay here. Um, of course, the consequence of setting a more stringent alpha is going to be larger sample sizes. Um, so I've illustrated that here by putting a sample size on top of each panel. Um, these sample sizes are calculated for a paired t-test design with an assumed effect size of Cohen's d of 0.5. That's an example that I'll be using uh, later on in the talk as well. So you can see here that you have 80% um, power over here, the conventional threshold. When you go to um, significant threshold of 0 0.05, the m goes up to 57. That's a lot more subjects, right? Um, but there's also a chance here to eyeball sort of what would happen if we change the significance threshold without collecting more data which is maybe the more plausible outcome if Benjamin et al's recommendation was actually taken on board, which I think is unlikely. Um, so if we look at this panel over here with 95% uh, power and an alpha of 0 0.05, the subject requirements for that is actually quite comparable to the sample size requirements for a power of 80% and an alpha of 0 0.05 over here. So by comparing these two panels across, you can sort of see what happens if you keep the sample size approximately constant and change the alpha. And what you can see is you basically shift the range over which you're making good decisions with null hypothesis significance testing over to the left of the plot. So you're better at distinguish, at, you have more confidence in your inferences when you're going after rare effects. Um, and maybe that's, that's valuable in some conditions, right? So um, let's conclude what we've learned. Uh, from this presentation so far. Low power means that we have low trust in reported non-significant and significant tests. That's an important point. It's a common misconception that power is only a concern if you haven't rejected the null hypothesis, 
whilst false positive rates are only a concern when you have rejected a null hypothesis. It's not the case. Both alpha and beta uh, play into both positive and negative predictive values. So power is important for both types of results and how much confidence you should have in them. Um, we can't reason about reproducibility without having some minimum modicum of prior belief. Right. Um, and I know this is unpleasant and uncomfortable because we really have no idea where this effect prevalence rate parameter should, what that should be set to. But if we don't do that, then we are literally in the dark about this, right? We don't know if we're making good decisions or bad decisions when we say there is an effect when P is less than 0.05 and not otherwise. So I hope you'll agree that it's, it's worth worthwhile thing to do, at least as a thought exercise. Um, whether you buy into John Ioannidis' claim that most published research findings are false will depend on your beliefs about power and effect prevalence. So we've seen positive predictive values under 50% a few times already in this presentation. Um, have to think for yourself about whether you think that's reasonable or not. So we've seen that null hypothesis testing can work well or it can work very badly depending on where you are in this parameter space. Um, this is probably my only original contribution to this, uh, to this work is really just plotting out the NPV as well as the PPV. So I think in general, in science, we need to have some confidence in not just the positive results, but also the negative results. Certainly for your own research program, when you're trying out experiments, if something works, you wanna be able to follow that up. When something doesn't work, you wanna have some confidence that that means there was nothing there and you can profitably pursue another direction. If you can only trust your positive results, then that's, you're still kind of, half in the dark, I think. Um, and we've seen that if you're going after rare or um, high risk effects uh, with null hypothesis significance testing, uh, the way to have some confidence in your conclusions is to set a stricter significance threshold. Um, so before I leave this uh, section of the talk, I just wanna bring up this quote from Danny Kahneman. This is one you may have seen before. So here, um, Kahneman is talking about, has just finished reviewing a bunch of fairly outlandish results in social priming, um, most of which have since then turned out not to replicate, which is why this, this quote is fun. Um, so what he says here is, the idea you should focus on, however, is that disbelief is not an option. The results are not made up, nor are they statistical flukes. Hmm. You have no choice but to accept that the major conclusions of these studies are true, more important to most accepted are true about you, etc. So um, I would say that this is really the wrong way to think about null hypothesis significance testing. Right? So I think we have a tendency to automatic thinking in this field where we say, well, okay, if someone has shown something P less than 0.05, then that's a fact. And it's something that we have to take on board in our theorizing. We have to mention it when we're discussing interpreting our results and so on. And that is not the case. So we've seen that statistical significance does not necessarily produce, represent strong evidence for an effect. Um, if you suspect that the true effect prevalence rate is low, like in the BEM example, or if you suspect that power is low because perhaps the investigators are collecting something like 10 subjects per group in a between subjects design, which was the case in a lot of the social primary research, then that's, it's okay to not believe in those significant p-values. Um, you do have to, you are allowed to think for yourself. Um, so that's the bulk of my talk. I want to briefly talk about um, a more practical issue and that is the curse of low power. So let's suppose that you on board with this idea that having low power can be really bad, not just for in terms of false negatives, but also in terms of false positives. Uh, you want to have better power. So you go look in the literature, you find a previous study that has report an effect and you do your sample size calculation. Um, there is a sort of curse of low power. And by that, I mean, low power can sort of haunt you if you are in a particular literature. Um, so if previous studies were underpowered and you use their, um, their effect size estimates, uh, you can end up perpetuating low statistical power. So let me show you how that works out in practice. So, before we can do sample size calculations, we have to talk about standardized effect sizes. Um, so what I'm not gonna do today is talk about all of these different ways to define effect size. Uh, if you want, you can read this paper from Daniel Lockins. It's a really good sleep induction. And um, I think the thing I want to show you here is that most of these effect size metrics don't matter for what we're trying to do here. So 
Um, most of these effect size metrics are used for meta-analysis. Um, when we're doing sample size calculations, we generally want simpler effect size metrics, which is kind of convenient for us. So for the example I'm going to work through with you today, we're still with a paired t-test design, so we're comparing two means within subjects, and for that the relevant effect size is Cohen's dz, which is going to be the average mean difference divided by the standard deviation of that mean difference over your subjects. Um, so pretty simple thing to calculate. Um, in practice, I would recommend calculating it through this neat conversion from the t-statistic. So you can just take t divided by square root of n to obtain dz for a um, given design. Um, and the reason why this is attractive is because when people report Cohen's d in the literature, it's quite possible that they're reporting a different Cohen's d flavor from the one you actually want for sample size calculations. So a bit safer, I think, to go from, to start with the t-statistics and work out Cohen's d for yourself in this. Um, so if we have Cohen's d, um, so let's think about Cohen's d and what size effect that might take. I was really pleased to see this paper from, um, this is Russ Paul Drack and colleagues. This analysis was actually done by Jim P. Dernis. Um, so this is uh, fMRI with uh, Cohen's D on the x-axis down here for a bunch of contrasts and regions of interest. Um, so what we've done here, they've done here is they've identified regions of interest from neurosynth that are supposed to be involved in the cognitive processes they're studying, like emotion, gambling, working memory. Um, and then for those ROIs, they plotted out the group level contrast, um, which are shown here. Um, and then we plot in these um, histograms, you have the Cohen's D over the voxels in each ROI. Um, and the ones that I would pay special attention to if I were you are the ones that start down here because the first ones contrast the task with rest. And I think that's kind of uninterpretable at the best of times. Um, so if you look at these sort of slightly tighter, more cognitive contrasts down here, um, if we look at the effect size, it's kind of interesting. So here we start with working memory, two back versus zero back in the MFG, and you can see the effect size is about 0.5, typically. Um, rarely is it greater than 0.8, which would be Cohen's convention for a large effect size. Um, fearful versus neutral faces in the amygdala. Effect size is actually a bit bigger, that surprised me. Um, and you can see that, again, effect size rarely goes over 0.8, which would be classed as a big effect. Um, gambling effects, so this is reward versus punishment in the um, nucleus accumbens. You see this is a smaller effect. It's maybe expected you're going for a subcortical nucleus because it's gonna be noisy, but um, again, the effect size is sort of over, well, hopefully over Cohen's definition of a small effect, 0.2, but certainly nowhere near the definition of a large effect. So that gives you sort of a flavor of where effect sizes might lie in fMRI. Um, and that's sort of where I came up with this value of Cohen's D of 0.5, which is what I'll use in the subsequent calculations. Of course, if the typical effect is 0.5, you probably also know that the typical sample size that we collect is 20, right? Um, for your average fMRI project which is not gonna be enough to have 80% power. It's actually enough for about 50, 54% power. Um, so let's simulate that kind of literature. So, so here I've run um, a simulation 5,000 times. So that's the densities in the histogram here. Um, so, each, so in each case, we're simulating a true effect. So there are no, there are no, um, there are no false positives here. Um, so the effects are drawn from a population effect of 0.5. Um, we have 20 subjects per uh, effect, and you can see sort of the distribution of the Cohen's D estimates that come out of each of these individual N20 studies here. Um, and the thing to appreciate is that there's quite a bit of spread in what sort of D you get. You can end up with a Cohen's D that's greater than one in um, close to 5% of the cases. That's a very large effect, so you'd be happy with that. Um, on the other side, occasionally you can end up with an effect that goes in the wrong direction. Um, but even within sort of one standard deviation of the median here, um, you're getting effects that 
go range from close to a large effect in Cohen's parlance, 0.8, and close to a small effect, so 0.3, 0.2. Um, so there's quite a bit of variance here. And if you just read the literature, you find one single study with 20 subjects, um, you could end up at any of these positions in the histogram, right? And the situation gets, it's perhaps more transparent to think about this uh, in terms of the sample size requirements. So if you take these Cohen's D estimates and then we calculate the required sample size for 80% power. So say we're doing a new study, we've read one of these papers, we take that effect size estimate, we calculate the sample size, this is the distribution you get. Um, so this has a really long tail. I've capped it at 200 here. It actually goes into the thousands. Um, the reason why it has this long tail behavior is because when Cohen's D gets close to zero, you need increasingly huge effect size, uh, huge sample sizes to achieve 80% power. Right? So those cases uh, over here in the graph where Cohen's D ended up close to zero will put you all the way up to the right in terms of the sample size calculation. Um, so the first observation then is that if you pick a single N20 study here and you try to calculate what gets you 80% power, you're all over the place, right? There is, you could, easily be over here, you could be over there. Um, probably over here, you wouldn't even do the study, right? Because you, if the sample size calculation comes back with 100 subjects, it kind of game over at that point, right? Um, which gets me on to the next point, which actually makes the situation worse. Um, we don't tend to calculate sample sizes unless the study we're following up was statistically significant. It's a lot, a lot of conditions where you'd be pursuing a non-significant effect further. Um, so if we color code our distribution of simulation effect sizes according to statistical significance, you can see that just over half of the distribution is orange, which means the p less than 0.05. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because um, we saw already that analytically with 20 subjects, we expect to have 50, 54% power for an effect size of 0.5. And indeed, empirically, that's that's the part of the distribution that works out to being significant here. So that's good. Um, but this is where, this is the thing that now we're only gonna look at this part of the distribution, right? This is the only part of the distribution that we're likely to sample from when we pick a single paper from the literature to base our sample size calculation on. And what happens then with our sample size distribution? Well, it's gotten capped quite severely, right? Now, practically all, of the times you're going to come up with a sample size which is underpowered relative to the ground truth effect size. So I've da in the dashed lines, I'm showing you the ground truth effect, the real effect that we're sampling from. And you can see that to have 80% power, we're at about 34, which is what we saw before. Um, and you can see in the vast majority of cases, we are going to end up suggesting a sample size that is underpowered relative to that. Um, so this is the curse of low power, right? That by taking the significance filter on the real distribution, we're ending up with these estimates that are kind of doomed to end up very close to where we started. So that's the other thing you might appreciate. If you look at this distribution, if you think about where the mean or the median is in this, go straight down the x-axis, that's about 20. That's the sample size that we're simulating in the individual simulations, right? That was about 20 that we started with. And after applying the significance filter, we end up concluding that that's exactly the sample size you need. That's useful. Um, although we know, of course, that the real sample size that you actually need to have 80% power is more like 34 over here. So that's the curse of low statistical power. Let me plot that out more systematically to show you that this is not just a contrived example for one particular part of this analysis space. Here on the x-axis, we've got the required sample size for a range of simulated uh, ground truth effect sizes. This is the same kind of simulation, but now I'm only going to plot out some medians. Um, so we're going here in Cohen's D, we're going from 0.8, which is a large effect, to 0.2. And on the x-axis, you can read off what the real sample size requirement is to power that analysis for a paired T design. Um, and you can see that it runs from something like 12 subjects to almost 200 to pursue a 0.2. One thing you can appreciate, by the way, is that these points really spread out as you get closer to 0.2. So it does make a big difference for your experimental design uh, 
whether the Cohen's D you're going for is 0 0.3 or 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, it makes a big difference, right? It, this somewhere at this point you might attempt and decide not to even attempt the study. Um, so that's the x-axis. On the y-axis, I'm plotting the sample size that this kind of naive power analysis might give you. So we're going to take the simulation, we're going to take the median power out of the significant cases in each time. So the first line I'm plotting here is for a sample size of 10, so half the sample size that we simulated before. And what you can see happening here is that as the effect size that's really going on goes up, the sample size that you end up recommending after passing your data through the significance filter hardly changes at all. You basically end up recommending the same sample size, some, somewhere just north of 10, every single time, even though the true effect size would be up at the unity line, right? So you should be recommending 200 subjects for 80% power, but by passing it through the significance filter, you get the impression that 10 subjects is plenty for 80% power. And the same pattern obtains as we increase the sample size that goes into the individual simulation. So with 20 subjects, this is the kind of thing we saw before. So point sat the line saturates at about 20, 25 subjects. There's 40 subjects per experiment. The line saturates at just under 50. With 80, it hasn't quite saturated yet in this simulation, but it is going to end up somewhere under 100. So, in a way, the best predictor of what sample size you'll end up recommending here is the sample size you started with, not the sample size that you actually need to have 80% power. Um, so this is the kind of challenge of having a literature with publication bias where only significant results are reported, um, coupled with attempts to do power analysis. So, this can lead you quite badly astray. And the end result then is that you end up thinking that you've powered your study adequately, but really you're doing another underpowered study. The, power, the low power perpetuates itself. Um, do I have time for this? No, I, I was gonna make fun of Carl Friston here, but I'll do that another time. Um, so let's close on some uh, recommendations. So first of all, uh, Perhaps an obvious point, but this is uh, a nice paper that simulates it with quite a lot more sophistication than the sort of meta science calculations I've shown you here. So in this paper, we're looking at the rate of canonizing a false positive as fact. So in other words, a false positive result that is seemingly replicated enough times through publication bias to become accepted as a truth in the field. Um, so you might be thinking, for instance, about social priming here. Um, if we look at how much that happens in this simulated experimental literature for different values of, power, of false negative rates, B up here, different significance thresholds, alpha in the lines, and other simulation parameters here that I won't go into. The basic take home message is that unless a substantial proportion of the negative results are published, this is going to happen with some frequency. So the only way to avoid to have a self-correcting literature is going to be to publish negative results. And Arguably, that's what we should all be doing right now. You know, we can't collect data right now. Um, even if we manage to start testing in some limited capacity soon, um, perhaps we should be going back to the file drawer instead, because if you've been in science for a few years, I'll bet you you're sitting on a couple of results that you haven't written up. Certainly, I have a bunch. Um, and this is, you know, it's a great lockdown activity. It's very safe. You're socially distanced, and you're helping improve science. Um, what could be wrong with that? So um, I'm going to close on some general recommendations for what we can do to improve this situation um, in ascending order of controversy. Publish negative results. We already talked about that. Uh, if you don't do that, then all of these other things about improving power and stuff are, is not going to protect us. Um, we need to start publishing negative results one way or another. Um, if when you're planning a new study and you're calculating your sample sizes, uh, please don't use the estimates from individual previous published studies. That estimate is going to be either extremely high variance or extremely biased. Um, I think the best place to go for effect size estimates is to look at these pre-registered large consortia. So the many labs projects, human connection projects, places like that, even if that means that you're powering based on effect size that's only loosely related to what you want to do, we saw in that HCP analysis that the effect sizes over a bunch of fairly distinct paradigms are actually kind of similar. So that's probably okay. 
to be do powering according to a fairly different effect, it still gets you in the right ballpark, which is not guaranteed if you go by single small studies from the literature. Um, the other way to go would be to just go by convention to say, that, okay, we'll just power everything according to a medium sized effect. I think that's can be sensible too. Um, pre registration is a good idea, um, certainly if you're going to publish some negative results. Um, we could adopt different criteria for significance, uh, or we could go to these sort of justify your alpha things that I haven't talked about, um, where you basically set your alpha according to, you know, as another experimental parameter that you justify to the reviewers. Um, you could go all in on Bayes, uh, so you might conclude from this little discussion we've just had that this is just unacceptable. My hypothesis significance testing is just not working. I'm, you know, I don't know what my effect prevalence rate is. I don't know what my power is. I can't deal with all this uncertainty. I'm just going to throw out this inferential system. That's, that's a reasonable position to take too. Um, final solution that I'm most partial to myself is to move more to consortium approaches. Certainly in neuroimaging, I think um, the kind of sample sizes that we probably need for adequate statistical power are beyond the resources of a typical lab. So I think the way for us to deal with this in the future is going to be to band together and do large publicly available studies that we then analyze and reanalyze together as a field. Um, I don't, I think we're sort of at the end of what you can learn from the brain with n equals 20 per fMRI study. Um, and I'm gonna close there. I'm gonna leave this slide open. There are some nice resources you can look up uh, if you want to learn more, I particularly recommend Tom Nichols' IOG talk on fMRI power, where he talks a lot about the positive predictive value. Um, also, if you're interested in learning more about PPV and stuff, um, the stuff, the calculations in the first part of the talk are all come out of this Jupyter notebook that's available here. Um, so you can read more about that there, or you can download the notebook and change the parameters and see how the figures change, which might be a useful way to learn more, I hope. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Owen. Uh, if people could use their little buttony buttons to do the, the clappy clap thing, um, then I'm going to in a meantime stop all the recording. <laughs>